I want to open up today's message by talking about God giving the world his only begotten son. God, he sent his only begotten son to this world for one specific purpose and for one specific reason. The reason why the Lord gave the world his only begotten son was to save it, to save the world from his judgment, to save the world from his fiery indignation against sin. Jesus, he came to this world not to save some people, not to save one nationality, not to save one race of people. He came to save the world, which is filled up with everybody all manner of people, all nations of people. And because he was sent to this world to save everybody, that means that he was sent to this world to save you. Jesus, he confirmed this to us when he told Nicodemus, as recorded in the third chapter of John's gospel, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Jesus, he confirmed the notion that any and everybody can be saved when, as it is recorded over in the 10th chapter of John's gospel, when he spoke to his disciples about the good shepherd. Jesus, he told the 12 that he has sheep who are not of the fold of the Jews, but that he also has sheep who are of another fold. And them also, Jesus said, he will bring with him. Those other sheep, again, means the rest of the world. And Jesus, he said, over them also he will shepherd. And he said that he will shepherd over one flock of Jews and Gentiles. That, again, is everybody. So God, he chose the world, didn't he? God, he chose the world. And again, in choosing the world and choosing everybody, he chose you. I, again, I want to make that very clear here to all of you today. God has chosen everybody that also includes you. You see, I want this to be known today because sadly, many people have drunk from the Kool-Aid of the devil. I don't know if you hear me here. Many people have drunk from the Kool-Aid of the devil's lies. As we saw last week, the devil, he wants people to believe the lie that God doesn't love them. He wants people to believe the lie that God does not care about them. Do you believe that lie? But again, I tell you today, sadly, many people have drank his Kool-Aid and they believe that that it is sweet to the taste. But the truth of the matter, the fact of the matter is that the Kool-Aid of the devil, it leaves a bitter and a sour aftertaste. One ought not drink the Kool-Aid of the devil, should they? One ought not drink from the cup that the devil passes around, should they? You see, when you drink from the cup of the devil, it can lead to a very destructive spirit developing within you. There are many people today who are dealing with the spirit of self-pity because they have drank from the cup of the devil. There are many people today who are dealing with the spirit of guilt because they have drank from the Kool-Aid of the devil. Yes, there are many people today who truly believe in their heart, in their soul, that they cannot be saved because they have drank from the cup of the devil. And again, their guilt and their self-pity has overcome them to believe in that God will not save them. Do you believe that today? That you can't be saved by the Lord? Do you find yourself today in a constant state of self-pity? For you who may be wondering, well, what is self-pity? What do you mean by that, Pastor? 
Good old Merriam-Webster, the dictionary, defines self-pity as a self-indulgent dwelling on one's sorrows or misfortunes, what they may not have, what, what they may lack in life. They may look at what others have and they may feel sorry or bad that they are unable to attain what others have. I tell you today that it is unhealthy for one to constantly be dwelling on what they don't have. Do you hear me? It is unhealthy for you if you do this to be dwelling on what you don't have. But again, sadly, many people do that today, don't we? We, we, we often focus in on what we don't have and, and we don't realize what it is doing to our soul. You see, dwelling in such a place can leave one in a pit of depression. It can leave one in a pit of despair. And again, as we know, coming out of such a pit, if you do not believe that you can be saved, if you do not believe that the Lord will lift you up, it is impossible to come out of that pit. Do you find yourself in a constant state of guilt? Again, just in case you don't know what that means, guilt is defined as the state of one who has committed an offense, especially consciously, knowing that they have done wrong. Do you live in that state? Guilt is also defined as the feeling of deserving blame for, again, the wrongs that you have done. Or imagine offenses, or also one feels guilty from, again, a sense of inadequacy, feeling less. Some believe that they deserve to feel less than someone else. You imagine that? Feeling and thinking such of yourself, believing that you deserve blame, believing that you don't deserve better. That's a toxic feeling, isn't it? Again, I tell you today that it is unhealthy for one to constantly feel inadequate in their life. It is not healthy for one to feel as if they deserve all of the blame. Again, I ask today, do you feel yourself in a constant state of guilt? And then because you don't believe that you can be saved, there's no relief in sight. Do you feel yourself in that state? Some of us, we may not feel that way because, again, as I said last week, some of us say, oh, no, pastor, I don't feel that way because I'm saved. I believe in the Lord. And if you don't feel yourself in either of these states in life, good for you. It is, again, a blessing not to feel such a way. But again, for all of you today who find yourself in such a state, I want to make this clear to you today. You are right where your adversary wants you to be. If you find yourself constantly in a state of self-pity and guilt, just know today that your adversary, the devil, that he is attacking you. Every moment in time where you think about what you don't have in comparison to others, again, I want you to know today that is the devil at work. Anytime you feel like you deserve what it is that you are going through with no relief in sight, just know today that is the devil at work attacking your soul. The adversary wants you to feel inadequate today. The adversary wants you to dwell on your sorrows. The adversary wants you to dwell on what you don't have. The adversary wants you to dwell on your misfortunes today. The adversary wants you to believe today that you can't be lifted up from such a place. The adversary wants you to believe that God has abandoned you. Do you think that God has abandoned you today? Y'all may be saying no, but again, somebody somewhere 
is thinking right now that God has abandoned them. So as a child of God, we have a calling and an election to fulfill, don't we? We saw this last week. We may not be feeling that way, but again, there are those who are around us, maybe even in our own homes, that are battling self-pity and are battling guilt today. So we must preach to those who are succumbing to the lies of the devil. Do you hear me here? We must reach out to those today who are drinking from the cup of the devil. Once again, today, I tell you, we must combat the lies of the devil. We must combat the lies and the deceptions that work against the salvation that has been promised to us. And when I say us, I'm talking about mankind. There's been a promise of salvation to us from the Lord through his only begotten son. And we today who say that we don't feel self-pity, we today who say that we aren't dealing with guilt, we must preach to those today who are feeling that way. Will you join me? In both of his letters to the Corinthian church, we see that is what Paul we see that that is what he was doing. We'll see it there in 2 Corinthians, there in the seventh chapter, in the eighth verse, where Paul, he was sharing his thoughts on sorrow. He said there in that, that verse there to those of the Corinthian church, he said, even if I made you sorry with my letter, that's in reference to 1 Corinthians, the first letter, Paul said, I do not regret it, though I did at one point in time, I did regret it. You see, in his first letter, again, Paul had a calling and election to, to make sure to fulfill. And if you happen to turn over to the third chapter of 1 Corinthians with me right now, you'll see that, that Paul, he really got on those who made up the church there in Corinth. He got on them about their conduct. He got on them about their behavior. He got on them about their, their mindset. And there in that first verse, Paul, he said that he couldn't even speak to them as spiritual people. He said he could only speak to them as to carnal people, those who were, who were babes in Christ. You see, those who made up the Corinthian church, they, they were once very immoral in their ways. They were immoral. They were worldly in their ways. They were immature in their way. Paul, he said there, if you take a look at the third verse there, Paul, he said that they behaved as mere men, still envying others, still creating strife, creating divisions amongst themselves. Paul, he was, he was very upfront to them in that first letter. In first Corinthians, he was up front. Some of us will say that Paul was even harsh towards the Corinthian church in his first letter. I would just tell you that Paul, he was keeping it real. And, and you know how I am. Sometimes you just have to keep it real with folks. But this is one of those few moments in scripture where we actually see Paul feeling bad about having to share such a harsh rebuke with those who desire to walk with Christ. And, and I get where Paul, I get where he's coming from because there have been times where I have had to be harsh with the truth in my rebuke. And there have been times where at night that I have thought to myself, man, was I too harsh? And what it was that I said, was I too harsh in my preaching? Was I, was I too harsh in my teaching? And then I'm left wondering, man, I hope, that it worked out. I hope that somebody was able to listen to it. I hope that they don't hate me for how I preached or how I talked for, for something that I said. I get exactly where Paul was coming from. However, one must remember that God, when he rebuked the world, he was truthful with us. God, he kept it real with us through his only begotten son. 
the Lord, he rebuked the world, however, not to make us sorry. God rebuked the world for one reason, because he loved the world. And because he loved the world, he desired for us to be lifted up from such lowly places of, of self-pity, from such lowly places of guilt. The Lord desired for us to be lifted up from our wrongdoings, from our sin. And so Jesus, he rebuked our sin. He kept it real. Not to put us down, but to save all of our souls. So that we aren't lost in condemnation for everlasting life but so that we can have everlasting life in the kingdom of the Lord in peace and joy and comfort and in happiness of God. He did all that because guess what? Again, he loves us. He loves you. That's what he did for you. So Paul, he rebuked the Corinthian church there not to make them feel bad, but because he loved them. If I rebuke you, it's not to make you feel bad. It's not for my own personal gain. I don't get anything out of it. If I rebuke you, if I share spiritual guidance with you, it is because guess what? It may not seem like it, but I love you and I want you to do better. I want to lift you up with me from wickedness. Because again, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, haven't we? See, this is what godly rebuke. This is what it looks like. This is the purpose of godly rebuke. Now there are two ways one can respond to godly rebuke. One could dwell in their shame and throw a pity party. One can dwell in their guilt and throw a pity party, or one can be attentive to the rebuke. One can heed the godly rebuke. The devil, he would want you to dwell in, in your sorrows, in your guilt. The devil would want you to dwell in a pit. But again, listen to me today. God, he wants you to come out of that pit. The Lord doesn't want you to dwell in your sorrows. The Lord wants you to come out of that pit. So rather than being left with regret, Paul will see there in the ninth verse there that he rejoiced because the sorrow of the Corinthians led to repentance. Underline that word in your Bibles for me. Their sorrow led to repentance, their inner turmoil that they were dealing with, their sin led to repentance. Those of the Corinthian church, at one point in time, they did feel bad about the way that they was behaving, the way that they was going on. They felt bad about it, but they chose not to dwell in their sorrow. They came to realize there that they needed to make a change in their life. And the only way that they could be lifted up from that place of sorrow was to heed the godly rebuke that came from Paul. And so we'll see there in the ninth and in the 10th verse there that Paul, he wrote for you were made sorry in a godly manner, Paul said there. And then again, we'll see Paul, he said there for godly sorrow as it is in my key verse there, says, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. That is deliverance not to be regretted. Look at that. For godly sorrow, heeding God's rebuke, yeah, it may make you feel sorry. It may bring you down for a moment. But godly sorrow produces a change a correction. That is what repentance is leading to salvation. That is deliverance from your wrongdoing, from your sin. 
this it shows us that that God's rebuke is not unto death. God's rebuke is unto life. That is life everlasting for those who choose to heed his correction. Those who choose to heed his rebuke. However, notice there at the end of that 10th verse there that Paul, he also stated that the sorrow of the world produces death. This is a notion that reminds me of the old devil on your shoulder and the angel on your shoulder, that old cartoon that, that you would see when you took a look at cartoons every now and then when one was choosing between doing good and one doing bad. On one side, you have the devil saying, God don't care about you. God don't love you. And then on the other side, you have the angel looking at the devil like he a fool and saying, that's not true. These thoughts, they, rem they remind me of Job when after the devil had attacked him and he was wallowing around Job, he was wallowing around in all kind of self-pity and, and he needed help. And his so-called friends, they came along the way and rather than lifting Job up, they was doing the work of the devil. They didn't lift Job up. They was adding to his self-pity. They didn't even bother to minister to him, to help him out. Satan's thought here again is if he can get you to feel so low, if he can get you to feel so inadequate that you will turn and you will turn to God's face and you will curse God to his face because of what you may lack or because of what you don't have or because God won't give you any relief from all the wrongs that you have done. I'll tell you today, don't you give in to Satan's wishes. Don't you turn against God. We must choose life over death today. Do you hear me? We must again, not drink from the cup of the devil. We must choose life over death. And if you turn against God, if you don't believe that you can be saved, guess what? You have chosen a certain death. But I choose to believe today. As Joshua said, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I choose God today. I choose life everlasting. I don't choose condemnation today. I will not give in to what it is that I lack or what I may not have today. I do believe that I can be saved even if I ain't perfect and I'm far from it. I have my sins. I have my wrongdoings, but I believe that I can be saved. What about you? So to help those dealing with self-pity and guilt today, I want to remind you, God loves you. If you are dealing with guilt and self-pity today, I want to remind you those words, God loves you. Don't heed the lies of the devil. God desires for you to live free of self-pity. I want you to hear this today. If you are living in guilt today, God doesn't want you living there. He wants to free you from your guilt. Will you choose to be free from your guilt? Now, somebody may ask, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, God, he has written to us a, a very long love letter. Have you read God's love letter? You see, if you don't, if, you, if you're not quite sure, let me try to retell God's love letter to you. In his love letter, the Lord, he explained why it was that he created you. From the dust of the earth, you were made by the Lord. And God, he breathed into your nostrils the breath of life, and you became a living soul. That's what he tells us in his long love letter. And then he tells us why it was that he created us in his love letter. God tells us that he created us to be fruitful and to multiply. How many times have you heard that one from me? 
I want you to know that God in his love letter, he desires for you to live a prosperous life. The Lord desires for you to prosper. Do you believe that today? Then in his long love letter, the Lord, he shows us that, that when we mess up, because that's inevitably going to happen, we are going to mess up because ain't nobody perfect. In his, his love letter to us, God said, I'm merciful. God, he said to us, I'm forgiving. This, this is, again, is shown to us because when we was in the deepest of darkness, God gave his, gave the world his only begotten son who again gave his life for us as a propitiation, our atonement offering, the atoning of our sins is through the shed blood of Jesus. And so the Lord in his long love letter has said to us, I'm giving you a second chance. And guess what? For however long you have been alive, God has been giving you second chance after second chance after second chance, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for you to get your life correct, for you to get your life right. In his long love letter, God answered your sins, my sins, and the sins of the rest of the world through his son. And so whether you realize this or not, this right here, when I'm holding up it right here, one of these is God's love letter to mankind. And in this love letter, we are told about our redemption. Yes, we fall short of the glory of God, but we can be redeemed of our own doing. You today can be redeemed of your sins. Whether you again realize that or not. And so here is my point to you today. If you are dwelling in self-pity, if you are dwelling in that place of guilt today, you must stop feeling sorry for yourself. You must stop beating yourself up for what you have done wrong. You must stop beating yourself up for what you don't think that you have. You must stop feeling inadequate in your life. Again, you must pick yourself up today. You must pick yourself up from wallowing in self-pity. You must pick yourself up from wallowing in guilt today. And so the question one may have is, well, how do I do that, pastor? You're saying I must stop. Well, help me out. How is it that I stop wallowing in guilt and in self-pity? First, I tell you that you must truly believe today that you can be saved. You must believe that you can be saved. And then most importantly, you must believe that you are worthy to be saved. Do you believe that you're worthy to be saved today? I do. See, proof that anybody can be saved is found again in that long love letter from the Lord. In Jesus' own words, Jesus, he said to the Pharisees, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said there, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, I hope you heard that, to repentance. See, I love that verse so much. Because in that verse, it's Jesus telling us, I ain't come to say those who think that they perfect. You hear me? Jesus, he said to himself, I ain't come here to say those who think and believe that they are already perfect. I can't save them because they won't turn to me. I came here to save those who are imperfect. If you think you are imperfect, you are already on the right track. All you need to do now is turn to the one who can lift you up and make you perfect. Will you do it today? Now, if you don't believe that to be true, if you don't believe that to be true today, if you think that you are too inadequate, if you think that you are too sinful to be saved, I again have a message here for you today. 
I want you to take a look at and I want you to think about all of the people, the myriad of folks that, that we find who are saved throughout the scriptures. Just think about all of those folks who are saved throughout scripture. Not one of them was perfect. Don't believe me? I'll go over a few examples here that I got written down for you. I'll start off with Abraham himself. Abraham, one of the patriarchs of faith, a man who is of great faith. I tell you today, even though he was of great faith, he wasn't perfect. Abraham, he had his faults. Abraham, he had his errors. Abraham, he chose to listen to his wife, Sarah. Laid with another woman. Had a child by another woman. Trying to force into existence God's promise. And then when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, the Lord said to Abraham, that's not the son of promise. I didn't orchestrate that. That was you and Sarah's doing. I have something else that is at work. And then the Lord went on to do what it was that he planned to do for Abraham and for his wife. Again, Abraham wasn't perfect. Then there was Abraham's old scheming grandson, known as Jacob. Jacob, yeah, he was a schemer. Stole his brother's birthright, stole his brother's blessing. Not only did Jacob do that, Jacob, he had two wives, and then he had two mistresses as well. And then by all four other women, he had children. I ain't gonna hide anything from you. Scripture don't hide it from us. But then Jacob had his name changed by God. God changed his name to Israel. Yes, that is Israel. And then he had his children. God made a covenant with, 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 with Jacob, with Israel. And his children inherited the promise. They became God's chosen people. And again, if you know anything about his children, they weren't perfect as well. They danced around a calf of gold at Mount Sinai. God still didn't give them up, did he? Then there was one who we don't think about often in scripture, but I love her as well. I love her story. Rahab, the Gentile woman who lived in Jericho. Do you know what her occupation was, what her profession was? Scripture doesn't hide that from us as well. She was a harlot. In other words, she was a prostitute. All the men, they would come to her house. When the, when the two spies from Israel, when they showed up, they went to her house because that's where all the men hung out at. Was she unsavable? No. She turned around and she helped the two spies out. She hid the spies from the men in Jericho. And then when Jericho fell, she lived. And then she gave her life to the Lord. And you're telling me that, that, that we have worse sins. I could go even further than that. I don't even have to talk about David's story. We all know David's story. And then I don't even have to talk about Solomon's story because we know all the millions of wives that he had. And then he built temples to them, for them, for them to go in and to worship their gods. But again, David and Solomon, they were loved by the Lord. They were favored by God. They were blessed by God. Then there's my friend Peter. I love Peter. Peter, he was egotistical. And then there's my friend Paul as well. And he may have been the worst of the bunch. Paul said it himself. Paul, he stood by as a man of God was stoned to death with a smile on his face. Not only that, Paul, he persecuted the church. He persecuted the gospel of Christ until Christ appeared to him and he had a change of heart. You again think that you can't be saved today? You think that you're unsavable because of some wrongs that you have done or because of, of what it is that you may not have? Yeah, like I said, none of those people that I mentioned there, none of them was all that, that wealthy outside of David and Solomon. Peter, he, he was just a fisherman. That's all he was. Didn't have much. But again, the Lord saw fit to save them. Don't ever think that you are unsavable 
in the eyes of God. Don't ever think that, that you aren't worth it in the eyes of God. When you start to think that you're unsavable and that you aren't worthy in the eyes of God, you are de developing a spirit of defeat. You are already defeated in your soul. You are beating yourself up. Again, I say to you today, stop wallowing in your self-pity. Stop wallowing in your guilt today. To stop wallowing in guilt and in self-pity, I tell you today, he God's rebuke, just as those folks that I just mentioned in scripture, do just as they did. Again, we'll take a look there at the seventh chapter of 2 Corinthians. The Corinthian church, they chose to heed God's rebuke through Paul. And again, we'll see there that Paul, he rejoiced because there was a wonderful change that had, had come, come over them. In 11 verse there, Paul, he marveled at how diligence to, to the faith produced in them a clearing of themselves, Paul said there. Produced indignation and fear. Uh, vehement desire, Paul said there. Zeal, fire was in them, Paul said there. And then Paul said, vindication was produced in them. No longer were they those carnal-minded people, those worldly-minded and focused people. No longer were they immature sinners. A wonderful change had come over them. They let go of their past. Their past no longer had them bowed. They stopped listening to the whispers of the devil. They had been freed from those shackles. So to do as they did in overcoming their guilt and in overcoming their self-pity, you must love yourself. You must love yourself and then you must forgive yourself. You have to forgive yourself of your past. You have to forgive yourself of, of what you may have not been able to gain in your life because of some misfortunes or some missteps that, that you may have had along the way. You have to let those thoughts and those things, you have to let them go. This is something that many of us struggle with today, isn't it? Can't let go of the past. Can't let go of what it is that, that we don't have. But again, I want you again to think about this. And I want you to know that there is a reason that God gave his only begotten son, that he gave his only begotten son to you. When you truly love yourself, it will become much easier for you to face your past to face what you may not have, to face all of the wrongs that you have done. When you truly love yourself, that is when you will want to do something about yourself. That is when you will go to the Lord and you will seek his relief. When you will seek his healing touch, that is what we need today. Many of us, we are on a downward spiral today in despair and in depression. And in order for us to get out of that spiral, we need to look to the Lord, the one who can and will reach down and lift us up by his righteous right hand. God, he will set you free from your pity when you turn to him. God, he will set you free from your guilt and will forgive you when you turn to him. And again, if God will give you relief, if God will forgive you, then I tell you today that you certainly can do the same for yourself. If God can forgive me, then I better forgive myself. Being able to forgive yourself and, and being forgiven by God, to me, that's the ultimate victory. Do you realize that today? When you are able to, to forgive yourself, 
And when God has forgiven you, do you realize that that's victory? You see, that's victory over guilt. That's victory over what it is that you don't have. That's victory over your own mindset that's poisoning your soul. That, that's guilt. That, that's victory, I should say, over sin itself. Even more, it is the ultimate victory over that, that devil that sits on your shoulders and tell you, oh, God don't care about you. God don't love you. That tries to hold it over your head about what it is that you don't have and, and be whispering in your ears, oh, God, he don't love you. He don't care about you. He won't even bless you. It's victory. When you love yourself, when you realize that God has loved you and that God has provided for you, that God has supplied your every need, that God has made a way for you. Again, the devil wants you to tear yourself down. I hope you hear me here today. The devil wants you to wallow in that pity and in that guilt today. But again, I tell you this, I tell you today, don't cast yourself down into that pit. When God has a hand stretched out to you and say, hey, grab hold and I'll lift you up. Don't you be going off and jumping off into that pit. Jump into the arms of the Lord today. I give thanks to God today because God, he knows not just my work. God, he knows your worth. Somebody else out there, they may not think that you're worth anything. The devil certainly doesn't think you're worth anything. That's why he keeps lying to you over and over and over again. But God, he thinks you are worth everything. You are worth everything in the eyes of God. That is why he has told you the truth. He has told you the truth because he loves you and he cares about you. He does not want to see you fall to sin. He wants to see you rule over sin. He wants to see you overcome sin. God again sees again today that you are worthy of his love. God sees today that you are worthy of his grace, that you are worthy of his mercy that you are worthy of his forgiveness and that you are worthy of his deliverance of his salvation. God sees today that you are worthy of everlasting life in his kingdom. And again, I say to you today, if God sees that you are worthy of saving, I want you to see for yourself today that you are worthy of saving, that you are savable and that you can be saved. So again, I encourage you today, stop beating yourself up. That inner turmoil, turn that inner turmoil of self-pity and guilt, turn it into life. And you do that by turning to the Lord who will quicken your soul, who will quicken your spirit, who will give you life. Amen. 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 Hey, before you stop watching this video, I got one thing that I wanna ask all of you to do. What is it that I want you to do? If you aren't already following this channel, I ask you today, make sure that you're following. Subscribe below. And if you do that, I also ask all of you, make sure that you share this video, this channel with someone somewhere so that all of us can grow in our wisdom, our knowledge, and our faith in the Lord. And I ask all of you, participate in today's sermon as well. If you have any questions or any comments, don't be afraid to leave a comment below.